Yeah. Thank you very much for joining me today on a special day, the 17th of January, 2022, to uh, celebrate Professor Jalilia Motola, the seventh vice chancellor of the University of Lagos, as vice chancellor from 8 of May, 1995 to September 2000, when he resigned as vice chancellor. He was actually elected for a second term but he only did about one term of the second term. So what today is about really is to give you a sense of who this man was, my father, who he was, I mean, his career in Unilag, which is where he made his name, was from about 1971 to 2000. So you're looking about 29 years, 24 years after he got employed at the university, he became the vice chancellor, but of course he had been dean for two terms from 1986 to 1990, and he had been head of department of private and property law from about, uh, I think it was 1980, 80, 80, 1980, yeah, 1980 to 86, he was uh, the head of department of private and property law. So he had 10 years uh, experience in administration, at the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, and then the gap between when he was dean and when he became the vice chancellor was four years. Because after the ten years at the University of Lagos, he then went to Olabisi Onobanjo University, where he was dean. Now, just to give you, uh, of course, we're marking the anniversary of the renaming of the multi-purpose hall, which he built in around the second term. I believe it was the first term when he was in, in the university. I was not in Nigeria when he was the vice chancellor in the early part. I only met the latter part of his VC ship when I arrived in 1999. So I was only, he was vice chancellor for about almost two years uh, during the time that I was in Nigeria. And then he resigned. I'm gonna give you a sense of who this man is. Uh, firstly, he built that uh, multi-purpose hall which seats 5,000 students out of a population of about 30,000 or so of the, at the university. In fact, the university has about 60,000 people, where a lot of them are non-academic staff, staff, and some people don't live on the campus. But that hall was, uh, was built because he wanted to address the deficits of spaces if I remember, because I also went to Unilag, I graduated in 1988, and I remember that we used to have problems in terms of, especially in faculties like science, where there were a lot of uh, students, they used to have problems in being able to write their exams on a, a table and a chair. So that prompted Jalili Adebisi Omotola to respond by building that edifice, uh, which is now named after him. So we we thank the university for honoring him and uh, naming the university. It's now the Jalilia Debisi Omotola Hall. So as you enter the University of Lagos gates and you go past the turning into the education unit, what they call the College of Education, which is by the gates, the, the very short right you see there, you see the building. It's on a very small piece of land, but we thank the university again for having taken that bold step. So let me just give you a sense of my father's trajectory, at least as I know it. But by the time that he got to England, he was there in 62, and he went to study his A-levels. So 1962, at the age of about 24, he arrived in the UK to study. He studied in Amadia College in Ibado, where he had a nickname called Senior de Homo, Senior de Homo. Uh, of, of course, his surname was Omotola, but Omo is the 
detergent that you use to wash your clothes. So he was a neat student. So they gave him a nickname, Senior de Homo. He used to have a, an handkerchief, if some of you remember that when you're in Nigeria, you sweat a lot. So the, your collar will get dirty because of the sweat. So he used to put uh, an handkerchief, you know, to save his collar. And uh, yeah, so that was his first year in the UK, 1962. And then he joined the University of London where he enrolled for his LLB. And that was in 63. And then by 66, he received two prizes, one in English criminal law and one in land law. That was in 1966, the same year that I was born. My father was already receiving presents or rather prizes for his academic brilliance at the University of London, Queen Mary and Westfield College to be specific. And then in 1967, he did his master's degree again at Queen Mary and Westfield College. And then also in the same year, he was called to the grazing, the bar. So he was called to bar same year that he, he finished his master's. And then in 1968, he got a job at the estate duty examiner's office in Shepherd's Bush. And the same year he got a scholarship from the Western region of Nigeria, which was the days of the Western region. And he got a scholarship to pursue his PhD. He finished his PhD in 1971 with a title, possessory title to land under English law. And after finishing his PhD in 1971, so after a nine years so John, he had already had three children. So I was the middle son, Kunle, my older brother was first, 1965, and then Guke in 1969. And I suspect that what they then did, my mother and my father, was that they passed Kunle and I to Nigeria so that they would be able to handle the pressure of studies and work. So Guke was the only child who was with them and they all came back together in 71. So from 71, my father started uh, as a lecturer in Unilag, what they called junior lecturer at the time. I believe he was taking land law and conveyancing for the undergraduates. So conveyancing was a course on its own. It was in the Department of Private and Property Law, which he later became the head of the department of. And so as early as uh, those days, he was doing a lot of work in terms of writing articles, published work, and I'll read off some of that. But I just wanted to give you his trajectory. So because he was um, a lecturer of law, so naturally, as he would say to us, you publish or you perish. So in academic world, if you don't publish any work, you're not going to go far. You won't be able to become a professor. You won't even be able to be a dean and all of that. It's all about what you publish. So he came up with a, a, a logical phrase. You publish or you perish. That was his famous phrase. If you look behind me, you'll see his picture to my, I think it's to my left right there. That's my late father. I believe that was when he became a professor. That, uh, yeah, that, that must have been when he became a professor. I think that was in 1984, he became a professor. So anyway, so we move on. So he became the head of the department in, uh, of private and property law in 1980. He was there for six years and then he became the dean in 1986. And then he was reelected for another term in 1988. And in 1988, he gave his inaugural lecture uh, titled Law and Land Rights with Nigeria, where he gave skating criticism of the Land Use Act of 1978. So interestingly, Exactly 10 years after the Land Use Act, the biggest piece of land legislation in Nigeria, my father delivered his inaugural lecture, and it was a year exactly the anniversary of his mother, who had died in 1987. So, and he said in his inaugural lecture, in the preface and the foreword, that he owed all of his success to God and his mother, Alaja Yonin Kasara to Ajibewaji. Motola, who died at the age of 83 in 1987. She was born in 1904. So that gives you a sense of his trajectory, head of the department, dean twice. And after finishing as dean, he then went on to Ogun State University, now Olabisi Onobanjo University, 
that he was also dean. But interestingly, before he went to Ogun State University, he had done a lot of movements around Africa on the issue of land. So in 1990, he gave a seminal paper in Harare, Zimbabwe, on the implications of land reform, the Nigerian reality at the Land Tenure Conference in Zimbabwe. Of course, he also uh, jointly co-authored the laws for the Gambia. And that was in 1990 as well, when he was dean. That project was funded by USAID. And so he wrote the laws of Gambia as well. Now, let's now look at his vice chancellorship, which is the main, uh, main event, really, the renaming his vice chancellorship. I think on May 8, 1995, he said first that on the day he arrived at the university, that he was actually appointed in April, April 26, but he started on the 8th of May. So he said that when he first arrived at the university, his first job was to go to the gatehouse of the university. And for those of you who know Unilag, you know that there are two entrances, one from the Abulioja side, Akoka, and the other one behind that takes you to Sabo and all of that behind. The second gate, where you have the expressway, that's called the second gate. You go via staff school, and then you do a sharp right. It takes you down, down through the back. And he said he started at the gate because he wanted to find out, you know, the welfare of those whose job it is to allow people to come in to the university, to secure the ones that were securing the population for about 60,000. And lo and behold, he found that they were using the bush as a toilet. So his first, he was very angry, he was very disappointed, and he realized that he had lots of work to do. He also said, and I'll quote, in, a, in an interview he did with Cyril Stober in 1998 as vice chancellor, he said, let me tell you, I didn't come to office thinking of what to do. I was praying for the opportunity because I had made my name at Unilag. I felt I was a debtor and I must pay my debt. Unilag had done me so much good because if you say you don't know Motola now, even before I became VC, it was difficult for anybody to say I should introduce myself. And it was true Unilag. So I came there to pay back. I saw myself as a debtor by the time I asked for the office and I knew I could do it. I believed it because of my record as HOD, as Dean, even at, as well as OSU. I believe I could do it and I just went to work. So this was his statement that he made on national television in 1998 in the middle of his vice chancellorship. So what was Amatola known for? Well, one of the things that he said in that same interview, that when he, when he got to the job, the first thing that he found was the hopelessness of the water crisis, that there was an ever present no water situation. There was not a single drop of water in the university and it was causing problems for the population and rightly so. So he said he then went to meet the visitor who's the president of the country to say, I need you in two respects. One is to help me with the water situation. And the second is to build more hostels because the population was growing. And so that's what he did. And he got four boreholes in place. If I said the only borehole, the single borehole the university had before it became VC was not, they were not getting water out of it. So he said he then reached out to his friend who was a minister for water at the time, uh, Minister Yewa, that the minister then assisted him. So they got six boreholes in total, four from the visitor and two to the minister. So the university now has six boreholes. So his focus really was about results. So he did things like the work to study program is the one that introduced the intercom so that students, when you go and meet your lecturer, you know, those days there was no cell phone. So you won't have to be going back and forth so you now call with the intercom and that was easier communications. It was also very instrumental in painting all of the university buildings. He gave, I think about 300 professors, professorships out and he also paid the back pay of staff, be they academic or non-academic. So promotions were in full gear. But what he was very well known for 
was the commercialization aspect. And I think even that commercialization got him into trouble with some of his, some of his detractors, because I still read in the paper a few weeks ago that some people claim that he turned the universe into a marketplace. And so, but we'll deal with that in future. So, but today's to talk about the virtues of the man. So he was able to do Unilag water, which is their own water, bottled water, Unilag, under the Unilag Ventures, uh, uh, you know, category. They had a structure called Unilag Ventures. So he did water, he did soap, he did bread, and, you know, there was a work to study for indigent students. And of course, he increased the price of MBA from 25,000 to 125,000. So that wouldn't have been very popular, but he did it to raise revenue. He also, one of the things that he introduced was the car park scheme, where if you park your car anywhere in the university, you pay 40 Naira. So those are some of the things he did while he was vice chancellor, there was no strike and he had to battle with the cults. There was a lot of cultism he had to deal with. And there was, a, there was no strike. Academic Staff Union, as many of you know, they always go on strike. Under my late father, there were no strikes. But also another thing he said, which I picked up from that interview with Cyril Stoba, he said he was very annoyed about what was going on. And he was helpless before he became VC. And the students and authorities were at loggerheads. So he said when he became the VC, there were 13 investigation panels against students. And as far as he was concerned, he had to, he scrapped all of it. And then people said, oh, he was indulging the students. He then went to the halls of residence. And when he got there, he said he was so disgusted by the, uh, the level of the conditions in which students were meant to live. And he said that there was no way that students would be in such a condition without engaging in violence. So he, he, that's one of the reasons also why he went to the head of state to build more hostels, because he couldn't understand how students would be suffering so much. So he really cared about his students. He cared about their welfare. He cared about you know, the academics. He, as a brilliant scholar himself, he really wanted them to do very well. So, and he also cared about, he, in fact, one of the things he also did was to get land for lecturers in places like Magodo, and Kaitur, because if some of you recall, as a university lecturer, you're not rich. So where did you get money to build a house? So they were renting, staying in the staff quarters. So he managed to address that as well. So he was a man that looked at every angle of uh, not just the students, but also the staff of the university. So I told you earlier that he, he arrived in England, 62. And uh, you know, he, he did the Association of Chartered Institute of Secretaries in 65. I forgot to mention that earlier. And then I told you the prizes he got in 1966 in English criminal law and land law. And then in 1967, he's LLM and also called to the bar. He was actually called to the Nigerian bar in 1973. Because as you know, if you study outside Nigeria, you still have to be called to the Nigerian bar. So even as a lecturer, he still went, he still went ahead and did his bar in Nigeria. So his pedigree is here. So 1971 is a lecturer. 1978, he became an associate professor. 1980, he became the head of the department of private and property law. 1984, he became a professor of law. 1986, he was elected as dean for the first time. 1988, he was re-elected as dean. 1987. He um, first contested for the vice chancellorship and lost to Professor Alao. He contested that he won the VC ship. So as early as 87, when he was dean, he had already contested for, if I one year into his deanship, he contested for VC and lost. In 1995, he became VC of Unilag. In 1998, he became a member of the highest body of distinguished eminent jurists and lawyers in Nigeria, which is called the body of benches. So he's a live picture. In 1999, while he was VC, he also became a senior advocate of Nigeria and received a national award, OON. I remember I was there at the Sheraton when we were singing S-A-N-O-O-N. That was in 1999. And then in 2000, he left. After he resigned, he became a distinguished visitor at the University of Vitfax's Rand in South Africa. And after that one year stint as distinguished visitor, 
he then became an honorary research fellow. So he was now doing his own research with his research assistant, a gentleman by the name of Sipo Mukatakata, who was working with him closely in that small room at Vets at the Oliver Shriner building. And of course, after two, the only work that he says he's proud of that he was able to produce while at, uh, at Vets is the book that John only wrote on primogeniture and the illegitimate child used to tell me then that Tunji, whatever they say of my three years here at Vits, I can say that at least I produced a work and I'll share with you guys later. I'll send you uh, the work. It's very, very rich and it's very, very comprehensive and it talks to the issue of primogeniture. That was in 2003. And then he moved back to Nigeria, of course. But while he was doing all of this academic work, I must bring it to your notice that he, he was also an amicus courier of the Supreme Court, the Superior Courts in Nigeria. I remember cases like uh, Savannah Bank versus Ajilo, because I'm also a lawyer. So I, I had to read my father as well. So I read his books and you know those cases, Locos Classicus cases on the issue of Land Use Act and all of that. And then he was also mentioned in Awuju Bagbe and Chinukwe Light Industries, another case, Supreme Court case. So it was an amicus career, it was a British Council fellow, it was a Fulbright senior African researcher. He was many, many things. He was also, um, uh, he also got the Association of Commonwealth Universities Fellowship in 1989 when he was dean. So I think his deanship helped him a lot because all the Fulbrights and the British Council all happened when he was dean. I talked about his scholarship before. I talked about the Merit Award at the University of London in 66. The late professor also created a term. He invented a term. You know, as a professor, you have to come up with things. So he created something called the Deem Grant in order to distinguish it from the actual grant in the Land Use Act. It was first uh, contested in the Nigerian Court of Appeal, and it was accepted as Professor Motola's invention in the Nigerian Supreme Court. So he was able to add to the conversation about, you know, dim grants or granting uh, rights in terms of land. And then I just wanted to give you some perspective on some of his professional qualifications. I've mentioned Sanship, Life Venture. He was a member of the Board of Studies of the Council of Legal Education from 1987 to 1991. He was a member of the Joint Committee of the Body of Benches and the Council of Legal Education on admission requirements for LLB in 1991, as a member of the Governing Council of the Nigerian Law School from 1987 to 1991, was also a member of the Governing Council of Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies from 1987 to 1991, was a member of the EXCO of the Lagos branch of the Nigerian Bar Association from 1987 to 1990, was also a chairman committee on the review of company law set up by the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators in 1989, was the chairman of the Nigerian Bar Association Committee on the Review of the Nigerian Land Use Act in 1988. Now, obviously there's more to the man than that in terms of his contribution to academic uh, uh, work in Nigeria, but also the Land Use Act and the Companies, Companies Act, as you can see, and even environmental law. But some of these books that I thought I should share uh, the Essays on the Land Use Act, 1978, which was uh, produced by Lagos University Press. Uh, that was in 1984. Then Issues in Nigerian Land Law, 1991. Law and Land Rights, that's the inaugural that I talked about with the Nigeria, delivered on Wednesday, June 29, 1988. That was 10 years after the act came into operation. And of course, Possession on, of Land, 1994. I remember that book very well. It was published by uh, Madame Roque Fetuga under the publishing name Florence and Lambert Books. So when you look at this man's uh, work, it is really, it cuts across. I mean, Law and Development published, uh, that was in 1987. He co-authored that with um, Jay, with Adeogun, Professor Adeogun. And then Environmental Law in Nigeria, including Compensation. He published that book as well. Then the, another seminal work he did was the report of national workshop that was held at the University of Lagos in May, 1981. So that was three years after the Land Use Act. They had already done a report 
and that was under the Department of Private and Property Law. That was in 1981, so it would have been HOD at the time. Of course, there was cases on the Land Use Act 1983, which was six weeks, uh, six years after the act. Then he also created essays. Uh, he published essays in honor of Judge Taslim Olawale Elias, who was a former Attorney General and former Dean of Law. He did that in 1987. Elias died in 1991, four years after that book was published. And then he also did the essays on the Land Use Act, which he published in 1980. So in a sense, the, this is a man that really put his signature and stamp on land law in Nigeria and the rest of Africa. I mean, I told you about the, the book that he published, Indigenous African Property Rights System, a tool in land reform. He delivered the paper there in the University of Venda. That was in 2001. So even in South Africa, he was still really at it. Then he also talks about the critiquing the national approach to land reform. That was in, in South Africa as well at the National Land Tenure Conference at the University of Durban in South Africa, and that was in 2001. So with all this said, my own sense about this man, because I, I got to know him very closely. The question is, since he died in 2006, what have we done to promote the legacy of such a great man? Well, as a family, we've tried our best, but I believe more needs to be done because it's not every day that you come across somebody that has spent so much time in the university system. Even when he left the University of Lagos, he still came and sat in a small room at the University of uh, Witwatersrand and he was going around this country. He was consulting for NEPAD, he was consulting for the agricultural ministry. So from 2003, what have we done to try and, uh, or from 2006 rather, since he passed, what have we done? Okay, firstly, we launched a book. He had already finished the book. The manuscript was already with publishers. We just paid like four million naira at the time for the book. So there was a master's class, um, a master's class book. It's called the Secured Credit Transactions. So that was first published in 2007, posthumously. And I remember the foreword by Professor, uh, uh, Professor, I think he's a, not Professor Aluko. His name will come to me. But he said that it's not often that you see the scattered works of, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing the, the four words. But anyway, he talks about the scattered work. I'm now talking about the compendium. So, but he's in relation to the compendium, which came later. This great professor talked about, it is not often that you see the scattered works of an author being brought together. So I, I'm actually giving you the wrong information. That's to do with the compendium. But anyway, going back to the Secured Credit Transactions book, which is a master's class book, that book was published in 2007, cost four million. And then in 2010, the University of Lagos was very kind once again um, to do a posthumous award, not only for my late father, but all the vice chancellors that had been from Saburi Bioba, Kweni Njoku, to Adia Jai and Alao and so on. And so my father being the seventh vice chancellor, I was there to represent the family. And the citation was also given by this same professor again, whose name escapes me, but I will bring the name home very soon. Now, so that was in 2010. And interestingly, the university was so generous that they gave us a big flat screen TV that cost about 380,000 Naira at the time, which is about $1,000 in today's money. Obviously, then it would have been more than $1,000 today. And I remember sitting with the vice chancellor at the time, uh, Shofo Lue, and he said to me that, look, we have to do so much for your father. So I'm going to round up now. So we talked about a compendium that we did in 2011. We also talked about um, um, the posthumous. We also talked about the and then there was a 10 year anniversary that we also had, which was in 2006. And we invited, uh, I think we invited the vice president, Justice Mweze was there, Supreme Court Justice, former deputy governor of uh, Delta State, Professor Amos Agwe Utwama was also there. 
Incidentally, Professor Twama was my father's protege uh, for many, many years. And then 2017 was the renaming of the multi-purpose hall. And then in 2021, last year, I did a commemoration of his 50 years of returning to Nigeria on April 29, 2001, which was two days after Freedom Day. We marked it at a restaurant called Ethos. We've done quite a few things to mark his name. I believe in 2013, I also did on his birthday, April 20. We did a dinner with Philip Bona. We invited people like Edith Fenter, uh, Leboham Petla, and uh, I think the late Timmy Johnson was there. And I believe my wife was also there. So come to 2022, today is actually supposed to be called Jelly at the BC Omotola Day, because that's the day that a building in Nigeria was named after my father. And I'm very proud of his achievements. He was a family man. He had a raucous laughter. He loved dancing. He was very generous, always ready to give, always ready to give advice, always interested in academic success. He was a very, very uh, fast moving, very energetic man. And um, yes, I'm please do comment. It would be very useful to receive the comments because we're being recorded. Just your thoughts. Did you know about yeah. him? Did you, how did you hear about him? Yeah, I know. I can, I can really say I know him personally a little bit because my auntie then was his uh, personal assistant. Uh, I mean, uh, the secretary to the VC to him then. That was, uh, what was her name? The name just keep me now. Ola Nipekun. She was the... Yeah, she was the, uh, so I was having issue with my admission then. When, uh, even the admission was You're closed. not the only one. <laughs> it was closed. I was uh, pursuing uh, you belonging and I had accident on the road. So I decided not to go to go again. I can in Lagosian be going to, and they've already, I've already got the admission there. So, but because of the accidents, I was just, you know, depressed and discouraged. I told my dad, if I'm not going to travel again, I want Lagos. So my daddy just called my auntie. My auntie told me, ah, well, the old admission is closed. There's nothing they can do about it. So Boyana said, okay, don't worry. Let me speak with the vice chancellor. So she narrated it that I had an accident. She showed my admission letter to Unilogi and said he is having nightmare with the journey. And without the word, they just called me immediately. Go, this is the only opening that's available in education. Do you want it, yes or no? I said, I have no choice. I, I, and I went for it. And, and also when I got in there, that was my uh, 99, uh, a lot of things that now they, they, they despise him of against, they despise or conspire against him is actually what will have helped invest in now. Because most of the time we now, you know, when I got to UK, I now see whereby students are working and as well reading. He introduced that in uni like then. Students, a lot of students were working, you know, doing the minor jobs and everything like that. He, thought, he didn't disturb, you know, it shouldn't, there should be dignity in labor and it shouldn't be able to, you know, a lot of students were able to pay their school fees without, you know, going to their parents, which is a noble thing to do. So when I, you know, when we started, I, no, I, I, my parents were well to do, I didn't do much. But I have a lot of friends that were working in the bakery, working in the ventures, working in the hostel, doing cleaning and everything like that. And for real, it makes a lot of sense. That was one thing I really, though a lot of people condemned him there. But if we have allowed it to, 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 to continue, to have been a noble profession whereby investing will be so, so much self-sufficient and or even not for, you know, so many things that is a visionary. That's why I said he is a visionary leader. A transformational leader, but it's so unfortunate that in Nigeria, too much uh, nepotism, politics, and everything like that. When we see good things, it's of us to elevate and appreciate it, which I do for fault and everything like that. And when he left, I mean, he was a disaster for Unilag. Even the issue of courtism, you know, he brought all of them together. They said he's a member of courtism, that's why he was able. But this, this is a never, this is a, something that you can't just throw out of the out of the system. It's already there, established, established. So we need to look at a way to bring them into the forefront, bring them out of the secrecy and bring them out to the open for that everybody knows them and then they can be able to control their activity. But 
at the end of the day, people condemn it, and those people went back again and you know see what is happening now. They they became even worse. So at the end of the day, I want to appreciate your dad. He was a great man indeed, a, an educationist to the core, and uh, may so continue to rest in perfect peace. And all the good things he has done will never perish. And I appreciate the University of Lagos for always constantly appreciating the good work the man has, he, he, the man did. And I believe it will never perish. So we still get it perish again. Thank you very much for those kind words, uh, Mr. Alder. I'm very honored and humbled to be able to deliver this uh, memorial conversation on my father. I thank you very much. Yeah.